by way of introduction, um, my name is Daniel Dean, as Rob already mentioned. I'm originally from London in the United Kingdom. My background um, over the last 15 years has been um, almost entirely in design. So I originally worked in buildings as a structural engineer um, and as a, an architect, um, or did some architecture rather at university, um, and joined Motmac here around five years ago. Since then, I've been working almost entirely in transport infrastructure, which as many of you will know, um, is focused on underground um, underground projects here in um, in Singapore. And really, my I guess my interest and my my drive, um, and the reason that I I've become um, the the digital network lead is just from an interest in project delivery. Okay, I'm not I'm not necessarily a digital expert, um, but I'm interested in uh, finding out how we can deliver projects better. Um, so that's that's really my um, my background, and that starts to talk to the five areas that I'd like to discuss in the next 20-25 minutes. Starting to develop from partnership with clients, um, that's how we see successful digital delivery and successful project delivery. That It really comes from um, collaboration uh, and partnership and working well with our clients. Using that kind of aligned and consistent message um, on a project basis married where it's available with um, consistent and aligned government messages to start to develop a holistic approach to information management. So how we bring um, all of the project members into uh, the connected data environment and start to deliver the project as a combined global team. Those two things start to allow us to develop the 3D model development. So initially with 3D BIM, and then adding the extra layers of information, starting to talk towards the end about asset management using digital tools and how we might define a digital twin. So in terms of client partnership, just to talk a little bit about Mott McDonald's history, um, some of you may be aware of this already. Historically, we're very, uh, we've been very much focused on technical delivery of geotechnical projects. So ground engineering, tunneling, things like that. Um, there's a selection of our projects up on the board from around um, the Australia, Asia Pacific region. Really though, um, that kind of story and project portfolio has come from the United Kingdom originally. And again, that's where we found that um, our initial input and involvement in developing digital delivery has come from um, the UK, in part um, due to, I guess you could call them aligned government messages. So consistency of approach across different sectors. Um, and really in the United Kingdom, that, um, that was driven by an initial acceptance um, and a drive um, to, make, to make things better in terms of the delivery, not just in terms of digital, um, but overall project delivery in infrastructure in the UK. So that's been a consistent drive from the UK government over the last 15, 20 years or so. That's allowed the industry um, and government to develop things like the PASS 1192 Information Management Standard, which has become um, now an international standard, ISO 19650. Um, what that really means is that project teams around the United Kingdom have got some consistency and some surety about how they are expected to deliver their projects in terms of the digital framework, which is really important um, to start to give the teams some confidence uh, to work between sectors and work between projects. The final um, document that you see on screen is data for the public good. These documents are all freely available for download. You can just Google the title of them. Um, Data for the Public Good is starting to talk to how we might develop a digital twin and a national digital twin for the United Kingdom. Um, it's a really um, interesting, actually, document to go and have a look at. What it talks about, and we'll talk about this in a little bit uh, more detail later on, is developing a digital twin and how that relies, again, on consistent information management and really importantly, 
collaboration between people, right? So we can put the technology and we can put the process in place, but unless we allow people to come and work together as a team and collaborate properly, none of this really works as effectively as it could do. So that consistency of message from the UK has allowed, um, it's allowed Mark McDonald to start to develop, um, develop projects and develop national frameworks for project and digital delivery here in Southeast Asia. So we're working with the governments in um, Indonesia and Vietnam, amongst other co countries in the world, as part of the UK Prosperity Fund. Um, so again, you start to see that benefit of a consistent um, consistent delivery model and framework. We're also starting to see that in Singapore with the BCA, Integrated Digital Delivery. My question would be, um, does the IDD process go into enough detail to allow um, and kind of incentivize project teams to, to work together throughout the project life cycle, um, particularly around underground infrastructure? Maybe that's something that we can talk about in the workshop session afterwards but how we think we could um, help to accelerate that process here in Singapore. So the upshot, I suppose, of client partnership, um, looking also towards how the contractual um, and legal arrangements are set up, as Professor Chu mentioned, you, we can't really ignore this. As an industry, as a designer, um, the construction industry over the years has been set up as a, it's a commercial operation, okay? So there's lots of legal uh, and commercial things that we need to consider. As much as we'd like to share information, perhaps um, the legal uh, and contractual um, documents aren't really there to allow us to do that. However, when clients do uh, accept a certain amount of additional risk at the start of the project um, and start to incentivize the different people in the project team, to work together, it really gives us some, um, what we would say are definitely improved outcomes. Example up on the screen from the United Kingdom, the Ordsall Cord project. Um, Mark McDonald were working as a design joint venture with Ecom um, and really were incentivized as part of that contractual framework to work with the contractor to develop their 3D uh, building information model together. So you start to see from an early stage of the um, design process that we're working with the contractor to develop not just the design information in that model, but also the 3D reinforcement, which is done by the contractor. And what that allows us to do ultimately is reduce design drawings um, from early stages of the project. As a designer, it's fantastic because it means we have less work to do. For our clients, it's also fantastic because they have less checking to do. So if we can start to get everyone in the 3D model from day one uh, and use that as progressive assurance for the design, it really works well for the whole project. I want to ask for another show of hands. I think I know the answer. If there's only four or five of us that are working on projects currently, um, my question to you is, if you wouldn't mind, how many of you are currently working in a connected data environment? on your projects. I'm hoping for two yeses from the mock map guys at the back. Thanks guys. Okay, cool. So I'll come on to CD in a moment. Um, essentially what we find on infrastructure projects today is that different parties are working in different areas and different locations, right? So everyone might have their own network drive where they store and share their information to move between um, to move, between, move information between different parties from a designer to the contract to the, to the client. We then have to send an email, for example, or send it via FTP, which opens up a number of information security risks as um, Jakob touched on earlier on. So to start to um, develop that into a more collaborative environment, what we, um, what we would advocate is the use of a connected or common data environment essentially is one piece of software where all of the members of the project team work together to eliminate, um, eliminate the sharing of information between uh, or through emails rather. So there is one single source of truth for each file on the project and only one. And only the people that are supposed to be able to see that file at any one time can see it. 
So what the CDE starts to do is bring in some um, rigor into how, um, how information is shared and also um, allows, as we see up here, repeatability of processes. Um, so the slide up behind me is from um, one of our clients in Australia, Transport for New South Wales, who we're working with on a number of projects down in Sydney. Um, so these are the issues that um, Transport for New South Wales see with uh, working without the CDE. Okay, So that kind of lost information, um, limited reuse of, of the data as well. Moving in towards um, a consistent common data environment led by the client, which allows them to get those benefits of repeatability and scalability of the data across not only their different projects, but between their different sectors as well. So again, building in that consistency. So very briefly, um, common data in environment, what it allows us to do is take a project file and then embed different pieces of information about that file um, into it. So it might be things like a drawing number, a drawing title, uh, the revision, information about the design or construction program as well. So that then allows us to tie together um, the different stages of the project along with um, the different stages and phases of approval of each of those files. We can then add in specific information from the client database build that into one single um, single file, which is the master information delivery plan. What this provides us is quite dry, to be honest with you, um, but essentially it is a single database or a single Excel sheet which contains every single deliverable that we need to produce on the project. And by going into the, um, the detail on each of those files, the percentage complete that they are who's done the checking and approval, the suitability that those files have been um, approved for allows us to build up a very accurate picture of the progress of the project, which we can then report uh, into a, a graphical dashboard using something like Power BI. I can tell you as a project manager, this kind of thing is absolutely fantastic, right? So you might have 3,000 deliverables, 200 people working on the job. How do you... How can you even begin to understand uh, with a, a good degree of accuracy how complete your project is and how, whether you're on track or not? This allows you to do that by using the CDE um, effectively. So what that's starting to talk to you then is using that CDE um, as a consistent um, background and then developing again the 3D uh, digital model, adding in those different levels of asset information um, which allows then potential for improvements during the construction, operation and maintenance um, of your project. So I've got a few examples now um, from some projects that I've worked on and also some projects um, from around the region from Mount McDonald. One of our key drivers right now um, in the industry is to try and reduce the reliance on 2D drawings, okay? Particularly around underground infrastructure where we've got really complex geometry. Um, this is one of the north-south corridor jobs, actually very close to one of the areas you were referring to earlier, Professor Chu. Um, and again, we see that phrase, single source of truth. So we use the 3D model as the single piece of information that everyone on the project team refers to for the design coordination we can then start to take cuts from that 3D model represented by the, um, the squares that you see up on screen. And we can then develop the design and analysis and drawings from those cuts. So everyone is working to the same information, which is really important. So this is what we're aiming for. Um, project recently completed in the United Kingdom, um, terms Tideway a traditional, if you like, design delivery workflow shown on top. So you start to develop um, different digital models between the different disciplines. There's a number of different drawings that are then produced from those 3D models. And the drawings are then reviewed and commented on by the BCA, LTA, other authorities, for example. 
what we want to try and do at the prelim and pre-final stage that up, up to around 70% completion is eliminate as far as we can those initial drawings so that we do all of the design coordination and collaboration in the 3D model. Again, that's good for the designer, it's good for the contractor, it's good for the client. Less work um, and less confusion around different copies of different drawings. Absolutely key to making that work. Again, looking at the people side of things is making sure that everyone on the project comes together on a regular basis to review that digital model. Um, starting to work through that collaboration and coordination and understand what the issues are on the job as a shared, um, a shared problem and a, a coordinated team as well. Just an example again from North South Corridor, um, taking the next step from the architectural structural design models, overlaying and federating those with the, um, the geological model, which we will develop currently from uh, boreholes that are found on site. Potential there, as Professor Chu mentioned, um, if we can work out the legalities for this information to be fed into the overall national digital model, um, which I think would be a fantastic thing if we could achieve it. And again, we're starting to talk towards a digital twin. Okay, so embedding, embedding information into the model um, and then starting to look at um, the possibility uh, of building in sensors uh, and other data collection techniques to start to link the physical model with the digital model. So in terms of the asset management, um, we've already got a 3D model, okay, which we've done all the design coordination analysis on. The next step for the industry really um, is to start to develop um, a consistent step, uh, consistent step rather, of um, asset classification um, IDs that will work um, and can be used across different underground infrastructure projects. There's currently work to be done on those, I think. Um, it's kind of in its infancy for a lot of the uh, AEC industry. This is um, an area where we've done work with clients in the United Kingdom for a metro project to start to define the scope for the graphical model and also define the scope for the amount of information that goes into that model. So we set that um, level of expectation up at the start of the job so that when the, when the client receives his end deliverable uh, at, the, at the end of the project, he's happy and there's enough information in there that will allow him to operate and maintain um, that asset, be that an airport uh, or a metro station or um, a roadway, for example. So another example from North South Corridor, looking at um, the underground but at grade drainage and utilities uh, for North South Corridor. Just a question to think about around the incoming information. As a designer, we will usually receive 2D PDFs um, possibly because that's the best information that's available. Also possibly because um, the client is not 100% sure about how accurate that information is. So as a designer, we will then develop that 2D information into a 3D model, which really helps us with the coordination as we've talked about a minute ago. The question is right now, what happens to that model at the end of the project? Because we will finish our work as a designer, we may give it to a contractor who will build it, what happens to it at the end of the construction project? It would seem a shame for that model just to be left in a um, file server somewhere. Really that information should be fed into a national database so that it can be used for future projects. So that we know, we start to develop a body of um, digital designed assets in Singapore. There's work to do to allow that to happen. Um, as I said, the um, the codes and standards and processes are not necessarily fixed right now um, to, to allow the assets to be embedded in the, in the model as we would need to do um, to provide an accurate end product. That I think is something that we could uh, work together as an industry to start to develop. 
I don't think it's something that would ne necessarily be done by a single um, single party on the project. But perhaps this is something where we could work together as the digital underground to develop a better answer. Jakob probably won't love me for saying this, but there's also work to be done, I think, with some of the software just to make that data transfer easier and more automated. Um, with Bentley and Autodesk and some of our other software partners, that's another area where we would um, look to develop. Uh, finally then, just to touch on the um, understanding of as-built assets. So you mentioned earlier on, Jakob, about the percentage completion um, of infrastructure in Singapore. Our chief technical officer at MotMac, Mark Enza, he's been involved in the development of the uh, United Kingdom digital twin strategy. The, the estimate and I think I'm going to quote this correctly from the Centre for Digital Built Britain, is that 99.5% of all infrastructure has been built already. So the amount of work or the amount of projects that are still to be done, 0.5%. So there's a huge amount of work to be done to capture the information that's already, uh, already been built and constructed. This project in the United States has started to do that. It's around um, an existing aqueduct system. So we've used a number of different machine learning and scanning techniques to try and reduce the number of man hours um, required to understand uh, the existing and as-built condition of that asset. Maybe again something that we could look at doing here in Singapore. And this is really a summary of those asset management slides. Maybe these are questions that we look at as part of the workshop. I'm not really sure. Um, but there is a huge, there's a huge amount of work to do, I think, but also a huge amount of possibility for us to work together as a, as a community and as an industry to help to gather that information and document it and start to share it in a progressive manner. Final few slides from me, um, talking to a digital twin. I mentioned data for the public good um, at the start of the presentation. So there's three key recommendations to that. Um, to that document. Firstly, around um, the need for a digital twin to enable better outcomes. And then using uh, an information management framework to allow that information to be shared and collaborated on effectively. Um, and then finally, looking at the people piece, bringing key people together to coordinate and talk and agree how that process should be um, undertaken. So this, this is an area where MOTS over the last year or so have really started to develop. We see the future, maybe five, 10 years time, as this being a key part of our offering as a design consultant. Right now in Singapore, we're, we're at the very early stages. So we are building a team here, um, actually called the Smart Infrastructure Team, to start to work with clients and develop um, new work and new projects around understanding how we can improve the eff efficiency of built assets um, and using data capture to make better decisions, find errors before they happen, and use that to deliver a better social outcome for the people of Singapore. This is how we would define a digital twin at Mark McDonald. Again, working, um, working with the Centre for Digital Built Britain as well. So a digital twin is essentially a realistic um, a realistic version of a, an as-built or physical asset. The key, the, the key piece of information that makes um, those two assets linked and twinned between the physical and the digital is this feedback loop that you see up on the screen. So we use the real-life asset capture from the physical asset, bring that data into the digital twin, Use the twin to develop insights and then make better designed decisions. And that might be partly human decisions, also partly AI and machine learning decisions to then go and make an intervention into the physical asset. So to start to operate and maintain that asset more effectively. Centre for Digital Real Britain, um, their, their vision for a national digital twin 
for the United Kingdom. You'll see very similar, um, very similar diagrams here. Essentially, we, we build that digital twin up um, item by item. So it might be for a building, it might be for a train, it might be for your hospital. And then we start slowly, piece by piece, we start to develop an ecosystem of connected digital twins. So trains, railways, roads, airports become uh, the transport digital twin, which is then connected into the power networks, to the water networks, to the healthcare networks. So slowly but surely, we develop this ecosystem of connected digital twins. The view in the UK is that this is a 30 year project. If the UK can do it in 30 years, we can do it surely in 10 years in Singapore. Um, so there, there's a challenge for us to see if we can, uh, if we can beat that. Um, that's really it for me, just one, one use case of that digital twin. As I say, it's very early, but it is happening. It is possible. We have delivered this already for our clients in New Zealand. Um, so using our um, database software called Mawata uh, to develop, um, it's a publicly available online resource called SafeSwim, which allows the public um, in Auckland to understand where are the safest places to go and swim um, outdoors uh, in, in the sea. And to allow the Auckland um, Council to deliver that information to their stakeholders, so to the general public. Um, they take a number of different um, data points and sensors across the city to understand things like weather, tides, um, the uh, sewer network and water supply network to build a good um, and detailed understanding of what the water conditions are like across the city. So again, we could extrapolate that to an overall um, national system which should cover transport, health, water, power, that kind of thing. That's it for me. Thank you for your, uh, for your time. Thank you for listening.